Welcome to Crime Most French, a fortnightly podcast covering intriguing cases carried out on French soil. Researched and narrated by Cedric and rudely interrupted by me, Melanie. We're the true crime podcast on the lines. Crack open the van and let the mayhem commence. This is episode 82, Vincenzo Ayutino, the man with 50 affairs. 50 affairs? Yes. Wow, busy man. In 1991 and 1992, several bodies are found in a forest in Lorraine, which is the east of France, German border. People think it might be a serial killer. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> kind of weird for just bodies to turn up uh, in the same place. Yes. So disappearance number one. On the 6th of August 1991, Isabelle Le Nenon, 20 years old, disappears. She works as a temp in an agency in Longuiho, in Lorraine, in east of France, at the German border. She told one of her colleagues that she was going to lunch, which she did pretty much every day. She had the habit of going to one of her girlfriend's flat, which was nearby, to have lunch on her own. Right. But she never comes back. There's, there's many, uh, a few French that would ever stop and just have a sandwich at their desk. Everything stops. Yes. And the shop's closed for two hours or more. Uh, Yeah, in rural France. Ugh, pain in the neck. At 3 p.m., her colleague calls her parents because she's worried that she didn't say she wouldn't come back. Mm. She is normally reliable. She's never missed a day of work without warning her colleagues and her employer. Mm -hmm. So it's not expected of her that she would just go away and disappear. So she's reliable. She's not a flibbity gibbet. Yeah, because she had the job she liked. So yeah. she was doing it properly and nobody would expect her to just disappear. Mm-hmm. Her car is eventually found in a car park near her hospital. All her belongings were still in it, including a sandwich. Oh no, she never even got to eat her sandwich. The doors are locked, like she didn't leave the car in a hurry. Mm-hmm. It was like she just had prepared lunch and vanished on the way. Her family reports the disappearance to the police. But as Isabel is 20, she is allowed to do whatever she likes without telling her parents. And if she wants to disappear, she can disappear. I hate when the police say that. It is so annoying. Yeah. So they close the investigation immediately. And obviously her family is outraged. Yes. They explain that Isabel was happy, that everything in her life was going well, that she has no reason whatsoever to disappear. But the gendarmes explain that all they can do is start, start a riff RIF, which is Recherche de l'intérêt des familles, so, des familles, so it's re- a, a search in the interest of families, but nothing more. It's just ridiculous. Normal people don't just vanish. Yeah, but at that point, there's nothing more their par- her parents can do. I mean, it's so fishy just to go missing in the middle of the day. Yes. The day after she disappeared, the cops visit the flat where she was often having lunch. And there they see that, indeed, she had been there. She had had lunch, and she had done some washing up. She even had a shower. That's weird. And they know for certain that she was there because the TV was still on. So obviously a flat that wasn't used, and that's why she was going there every day. Nobody right. was living in the flat, most likely. So with the TV being on, they know she's been there. Mm. The cops do the usual door-to-door asked neighbours if they saw anything, but it gets nowhere. During the day, not many people are around. Mm. In the meantime, Isabel's dad thinks about her car and the fact that it was found on that car park. He doesn't know why the car would be there, but also he has a hunch that it wasn't Isabel that parked the car there. And the reason for that is that he noticed that the wheels were turned and he told her to drive. And one of the things he thinks insist, insisted on was you never parked your car with your t- wheels turned. Your wheels have to be straight with the car. And she always did it. So now he thinks that it's not her who parked the car at the hospital. I think that really depends on what. I hate to disagree with, <laughs> with somebody who's lost their kid, but I don't, th- I don't agree with that at all. If you're parked on a, a hill, you should have your wheels pointing into the curb. Yes, but it's a flat car park. But also he taught her to do that. Mm -hmm. And she was doing it all the time. So when he saw the car with the wheels turned Mm -hmm. for no reason, 
He thought, there's no way it's her who parked the car. And you know, people who follow their dad's advice aren't ones for just going up and vanishing out, out of the blue. There's definitely something no. bad's happened to her. Yes. Also to me, but I haven't seen anybody mention it, the sandwich is strange. Because mm. if she went to have lunch at her friend's flat, yes. why would she also have a sandwich in the car? Yeah, it's a bit bit strange. What's the point of that? Because the, the cops know that she had food. There was food, like she did the washing up. Mm. It was probably still wet. She had done, uh, had her lunch. Mm-hmm. They knew she had lunch in the flat. Why would she have a sandwich in the car? Mm. It, it's it's yeah. weird, just weird. To me, it feels like it's somebody else's sandwich. So I would be with the dad there. It's not her yeah. who parked the car. Somebody had a sandwich. Somehow ended up driving the car and left his sandwich in the car. Mm. Because otherwise it makes no sense. Yeah, that's true. Isabel's dad's dad asks the gendarmes to collect fingerprints from the car. The door handles and the steering wheel must have fingerprints if somebody yeah, drove the car that else wasn't drove her. The car, yeah. But it's August. Ugh. And we know <laughs> when they're running on half the staff. Exactly. In front of everybody's on holiday yeah. in August. So the guy who takes care of the fingerprints is on holiday He's for on, a good, yeah. good while. So yeah. they can't get him. Yeah. And also the cops don't believe that there is a crime. So there is no yeah, point wasting they... time and resources mm. on getting fingerprints. So they refuse. Mm. There are cliches about France that are true. Uh, July and, uh, and August are pretty much, yes. from a bureaucracy standpoint, at a standstill. Yes. Her dad also checks her bank account and he sees that there's been no activity at all since she disappeared. Mm. Which, if she had run away... Yeah, she would have emptied her bank account. Either she would have emptied it before leaving, because you need money on the run, or she would have been using it as she was on the run. Yeah. But the fact that she didn't empty it and didn't use it since she disappeared is also very strange. No, it's just another case of the Rosers being lazy. Yeah. In the days following Isabel's disappearance, the Rosers hear from some of her friends that Isabel wasn't that happy after all. She had been engaged to a a guy for a while and she wanted to get married quickly. However, the fiancé, having started long university degree, Uh I don't know what it is, could have been medicine, who knows, wanted to wait until it was done. Fair enough. And she wasn't happy about that. And she wasn't happy that her dad was pushing her to get married when she couldn't. Oh, so so old-fashioned. Yes, I guess for her dad, once she's married, it's somebody else's responsibility. (laughs) Yes. He's in charge of the driving details after uh, after Dad's got her <laughs> yeah. shipped off. So they say that that was weighing on her mood and she wasn't that happy after all. As the police refer- refuses to search for her, her family starts doing it. Mm. But once again, the cops refuse to take part and they stop them. They didn't like the fact that they could see rifles in some of the cars that were going to look for her because it's the countryside. They all have rifles. Of course they do. And they are ready to use them, so they had rifles in the car and and the cops weren't happy about that, so they told them, don't do that, don't go look for her. Oh, I mean, that's just complete and utter bullshit. And what they wanted to do was block the roads and essentially filter all the cars to search them for her. And the cop said, no, well, you no, don't you do, that. do you that. You can't do that. Yeah, you have to be reasonable. But I mean, I think the ca- the cops, if they got involved, would tell them how to do things properly. But I mean, yes, but you know, that, there's not much point in setting up a roadblock, you know. Days after. Days yeah, I know, and days I know. after. But they did do it anyway. No, but it doesn't well, they get, go anywhere. Go, quite but right. They do it anyway. I mean, that that is the job for the police. You can't yeah. just, you can go out and look, certainly, but you can't just take over the police's duties. Yes. Yeah. On the 10th of August, four days after her disappearance, they find Isabel's handbag in an empty field, not far from the car park where the car was found. Mm. Now the cops get interested. Yeah. They get dogs and start searching. Mm -hmm. And straight straight after having sniffed the bag, three dogs take the same direction towards an old mine and stop near a settling tank. Oh, no. All three do that. God, if it's if it's mining country, then that's just going to be a bit of a nightmare trying to find people. Yes. So they call the fire brigade to dive into the tank because they don't want to go in there themselves. <laughs> yeah. But it's the last person holding their nose that goes yes. down. Yes. But the divers come back out very quickly because they see absolutely nothing. The <sighs> tanks are very dirty. They can't. They can't do anything. 
Oh, God. So the prosecutor orders the tanks to be emptied with yeah. pumps. Yeah. So again, the fire brigade came, comes back with mm-hmm. big pumps. Yeah. And they empty the tanks. They were 300,000 cubic meters each, <gasps> which is a huge amount of water. Uh, it probably leaves the fields pretty much how the fields are looking at the moment to here. We're totally yeah. flooded. Well, I would, I would assume they would have emptied it into a river because there's three 300,000 cubic meters. Um, I can't even comprehend how much that is. Well, one cubic meter is one ton of water. So wow. we're talking 900,000 tons of water. <laughs> So they would have had to empty that into a river somewhere. And 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 reasonably, kind of slowly, not like... Yes. Well, it takes a good while mm. to, to do. It takes them, in fact, six days. Wow. And the tanks are empty. Mm-hmm. There's no Isabel in the tanks. Bollocks. So the cops decide to change strategy, and they publish a call for witness via the local press. Mm-hmm. Several, seven people respond. And they are certain that they saw Isabel on the day she disappeared. And they're fairly reliable because most of them are either family or neighbours. Right. So they know, they definitely know when they see her, it's her. Yes. Not necessarily on that specific day, but yeah. they definitely know it's her. Yeah. But that doesn't help the, the cops. It doesn't give yeah. them any useful information. Okay. So nobody means no crime. So on the 22nd of August, they close the case. Oh, no, I hate when they do that because that means that's it. Yes. They're, they're just not, well, not looking do for her, anything. Yeah. She disappeared, and as far as they're concerned, she wanted to disappear, so that's it. No, they just want to keep neat paperwork. The family is outraged again, obviously. Mm, quite uh, rightly. They say that this is a case of social injustice, yep. that if they were rich, the cops would look for Isabel. Of course. So if they you're con- the right colour, and you've got an, a big enough bank account, they will... Uh, basically uh, up the world on its axis looking for you. Yeah. If you're a nice, pretty, young, blonde girl, you're, the yes. world's your oyster. So they contact a lawyer and they register themselves as civil party at the prosecutor's office right. directly. Mm-hmm. And by law, that ensures that an inquiry has to take place. R- that's good. That's good. So they force the cops to look into it. Mm-hmm. Now, on the 13th of September 1991, so we are talking a few weeks later. Uh-huh. Another young woman, also called Isabel, 21 years old, disappeared in Longwe again. Oh, oh. She was close to her family and was in touch with her mother every couple of days. So she was living on her own, but she was right. calling her mom every couple of days. Mm-hmm. She reminds me of my sister. <laughs> but oh, honestly, I'm glad you think she only phones every couple of days. She probably phones a couple of times a day. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I know she calls my parents a lot. But anyway. Um, she, on the 13th, she doesn't call. And by the evening, her mum gets worried. Mm. She calls her niece to ask her to go to Isabel's home to check for her. Mm-hmm. There, the niece reports that Isabel's mail is in front of her door, oh, which is not normal. No. Her mum tells her niece to go and call the fire brigade to break the door. Mm. Isabel Christophe, is her name, works at a checkout in the local Auchan supermarket. So it's very close to where Isabel Le Nenon, uh, Nenon's car was found. All oh, right, okay. The day after Isabel number two's disappearance, the, the cops question her colleagues and retrace her time on that day. Mm-hmm. She left the supermarket at about 10 a.m. to go home. She obviously works shift. Mm. It happens that her home was near the flat where Isabel Le Nenon was taking her lunch break. Oh, God, so many alarm bells ringing. I'll, I'll put a, a map on the website, but they're, they're the same street. Right. I think one is number 65 and one is number 79 or something. Oh, so so they're, they're nearly neighbor flats. So this animal's clearly kind of got very small hunting ground. Possibly. They visit the flat, but there's nothing there. No trace of her. In the flat... The cops find a letter where Isabel says that she has been dumped by her boyfriend and she was thinking of ending things. Suicide letter. Mm-hmm. She had been not well for a while. Um, as That came two years after her sister's death, and I don't know how I didn't look for it, and ten years after her parents' divorce. So at that point, it was probably getting too much for her and she decided, mm-hmm. I'm going to commit suicide, and she wrote a letter. The cops decide that most likely... She did commit suicide, mm. because everything's pointing to that. Which, of course, the family go at because, according to them, she wasn't suicidal. 
No. And suicide was totally impossible. I mean, sometimes when you're writing things down, you're not necessarily going to go through. But she didn't post the letter. No. So, yes. Um, so it creates a rift between the family and the gendarmes again. Again. They seem to be quite good at rubbing people up the wrong way. <laughs> yes. There are strange coincidences, though. There's two women, same age, same name, mm. disappear within less than a month of each other, in the same street, in broad daylight. The cops are starting to think that it has to be linked. It can't just be two random events in that yeah. tiny town. I mean, it would be okay if it was just their name, but it just seems to be during the day, in between work, yes. and them getting home. Yeah. Something, but, something's a bit uh, yeah, fishy. But they can't really link those things because they are just... Coincidences? Uh, that's what they, they say because they, they decide that the first one was a runaway, the second one was a suicide. So uh, how can they be linked? It doesn't involve anyone else. They're working hard to wash their hands of both uh, of them. Yeah, they closed the case again. <laughs> so the family refuses to, to give up and they start searching as well. Mm. They go around hospitals, they drive around, they even go to cemeteries one night because there was a witness that said that she had seen her there one night on her mother's grave. Oh uh, no, her sister's grave. But nothing comes of it. However, the two families, the two Isabel families, mm. connect. And the, the Christophs join the Lenin's family and they run the same action with the prosecutor. No, that's good. That's good. On the 20th of October, 1991, a hunter, Hans Rabbit, with his son, mm -hmm. in the Tourpanche Forest, which is on the other side of the Belgian border. Right. About 20 meters into the forest, they spot something. They get closer and they realize that it's a woman's body. Okay. It's very decomposed and half burnt. They oh, inform... Oh. So, but, but uh, kind of like a burn pit. Uh, well, somebody set fire to the body at some point, yes. So they informed the Belgian police, mm. because that's where mm. yes. it takes place. it's in Belgium, yeah. And the police involves the local prosecutor. Mm. The Belgian cops remember the two missing women on the other side of the border, in France, mm. so they contact the Longwood police. The victim has a number of distinctive um, items of jewellery, mm -hmm. so they describe them to the cops in France, because they hope it might identify the body. Mm-hmm. The police, in turn, in France, contact the Isabel Leninos family yeah. and they show them photo of the jewellery found on the body. Mm. And the, funny, the family recognizes them immediately. Oh, no. It's Isabel's body. The autopsy is performed in Belgium and it discovers that Isabel had been killed with a metal bar and has a lot of fractures to the skull. Oh, no. The Christophe family at that point starts to wonder if the same thing happens to Isabel number two. Yeah. So the local people start getting scared because mm. if Isabel number one was killed and there's a good chance Isabel number one was killed, mm. who's next? Yeah. So they, the, the population now starts thinking that there's a serial killer on the, on the loose. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised they, fi they found the body that quickly because in that area is, there's a lot of, um, oh yeah, but that was total chance. It's yes. just a hunter that happened to go hunting and found the body. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. it could have been there it's, forever. It's a lot of lot of trees up there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, very foresty. And the, uh, at first, the cops refused to investigate it as a sex crime, but eventually they decide that it can't be anything else. So they go through the local known uh, sexual offenders mm. on both sides of the border, and they come up with four names. One of them stands out very quickly. He was a mason, working on a building site very close to where both Isabels were known to go. Mm -hmm. He was working Avenue de la Gare, which is where the two flats were. All right. He was working at number 52. Isabel Le Nenon was having a lunch break at number 62. And Isabel okay. Christophe lived at number 79. Mm. So they were essentially all neighbours. We're talking meters away on, mm. on the map. You can see it's like a <clears throat> one of the houses of the story is like every two or three houses. So. Right. Okay. So the guy's really lazy. Yeah. If and it's him. Yes. And he had been in trouble before for sexual crimes on both sides of the border. Yeah. So they decide they're going to look into that dude. So basically he's a scumbag in two countries. Yes. That dude is called Vicenzo Ayutino. That doesn't sound like a local name. 
No, um, he was born on the 11th of March 1970 in Switzerland, so probably the Italian part of Switzerland. Right. His dad was from Italy, mm -hmm. and he married in Italy, mm -hmm. but he never recognizes his son. He moves Vincenzo and his mom to Belgium, I guess oh, to put some distance with system. Italy, because <laughs> when he has a son in Switzerland, he's still married in Italy. <gasps> he's a bigamist. Um, I don't know if he was married to the mum, to Vincenzo's mum. Oh, right, okay. But he certainly had a wife in Italy, some relationship in Switzerland, and he decides to put a bit of distance between the two. Oh, he sounds like an oily fucker. Yeah. In 1975, Ayutino is five, and he witnesses his dad raping his seven-year-old seven -year sister. Oh, my God. In 77, at seven, he sets fire to his mum's house, He's reported to child services, but they ignore him. In 1982, at 12, he starts stealing stuff from locker rooms in a local sports venue. He's found out. He's reported. He's placed in a disabled center where he's taught car mechanics, which he likes. Okay. But he's totally unmanageable and he's kicked out. It would almost be like he should have been seeing a psychiatrist from the age of five. Probably, yes. Mm, definitely. In 1985, at 15, he's working on a building site and shows his private parts to a woman. Oh, my God. He's fired from his job and sent to a psychiatric hospital. Yeah, well. He's essentially bailed out by his dad. In 1986, at 16, he leaves school with no qualification whatsoever mm -hmm. because that's the age you can leave school. Yeah. In January 88, he's placed again in a psychiatric, psychiatric hospital, but his dad makes him come out again. <laughs> Does that over and over again. In 88 and 89, he gets caught several times exhibiting himself and committing various sex crimes, oh, both in France and in Belgium. I mean, it's, it's really, really obvious that he's been completely let down. I'm oh, yeah. so angry at the at the father. Really angry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The father taking me now out of hospital yes. is just nonsense, but that's, that's what he outrageous. does every single time. In 1990, he's sentenced to three years in prison for sex crimes mm. on four women in Nongui, so that's the town we are talking about, mm -hmm. of which 18 months were suspended. As he awaits trial, he marries Marie-Antoinette Kaya, or Kala, a divorcee with the son. God. On the 14th of March, 91, he's freed from prison. He's 21. This guy just doesn't have a chance in life. That's five months before the first disappearance? Yeah. So the cops look into him because when they know all that, mm. um, they know that, yeah, okay, he's going to be involved in whatever's happening around here. He looks like a good candidate. Mm. On the 20th of November, 91, they arrest him. They interrogate him, but he's very calm. Very in control. It's not the first time he's being interrogated by cops, obviously, yeah. given his past. Mm. And he doesn't say anything incriminating. He doesn't deny his past. So he kind of tries to look honest and he even brags about it a bit. <laughs> so the cops are kind of furious at him, but there's nothing they can do. He has an alibi provided by his wife for the days of disappearance of the two women. So after 10 hours of questioning, they have to let him go. On the 25th of February 1992, Dr. De, Dr. De, De Donato, Dr. De Donato. De Donato <laughs> is worried. His girlfriend, Bernadette Boer, 41, hadn't come home from the previous night. Oh, crap. She was a medical rep, and on that day she had planned to visit 22 local GPs. She essentially pushes pills to the doctors. Yes. When De Donato reports the disappearance to the police, he's told that she's an adult and they have to wait 24 hours before they can even look into it because she can disappear if she wants to. <sighs> For him, it's a waste of time to wait 24 hours. He knows she didn't run away. Mm. She wasn't a little girl, so he contacts her boss. Mm. And her boss gives him the list of all the GPs that Bernadette was going to visit on that day. And then he goes and visits them. He visits them, we visit them all one by yeah. one. Yeah. Until he finds the last one who saw her. The doctor tells him that when Bernadette visited him, there was a guy in the waiting room called Ayutino, uh -huh. who was a very dangerous guy. God. Straight away, the Donato goes to the police station in Nongui and tells the cops what he discovered. Mm. 
The cops this time understand what's going on. So they open a kidnapping case very quickly and they look for Ayutino. The These hope guys are just raging in comedy. This, this whole yes. podcast is making my blood boil, I have to say. They hope that it hasn't been long, so Bernadette might still be alive. Mm. At Ayutino's home, which is again meters away from the GP surgery. Oh my God. This guy is so lazy. Yes. Nobody answers the door. They ask the neighbours, and they learn that on the day Bernadette disappeared, one of her neighbours noticed that Ayutino got home with a woman, which wasn't his wife. Right. She never saw the woman come out. Another thing that the neighbours noticed was that Ayutino moved a white 205 car several times on that day, and guess what Bernadette was driving? Mm. A white 205. Yes. That night, the cops keep an eye on Ayutino's house, and at about 9pm, Ayutino arrives home with his wife and kid. He comes out again a few minutes later, still with wife and kid, and gets in his car. The gendarmes are ordered by the prosecutor to arrest him, but he manage, manages to get away by crossing the border. Oh, bollocks. Into Belgium. The cops are not allowed to go into Belgium. Only the... Um, yes. Interpol? No, only the customs are allowed to cross border. Oh, right, okay. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So, so yes, the cops have to stop at the border and mm. he gets away. They wait for him to come back home because at some point he has to come back home, mm. but he doesn't. Instead, it's his father, who lives in Belgium, who turns up and gets arrested. He's interrogated and says that, yes, he's seen his son and he lent him his, lent him his car. Oh, fuck's sake. Later, Ayutino's wife also comes home She's arrested as well mm. by the cops. Uh, she, she was arrested by the cops as she was taking light bulbs out of the basement. Like she was taking the light bulbs off the ceiling. What the what? That's weird. Apparently, Ayutino had told her that if one day he's arrested, she needs to come home and remove those light bulbs. Probably because he's a dumbass and he thinks that by making the room dark, the cops wouldn't go there because the cops are afraid of the dark. <laughs> That's well, complete yeah, nonsense. They're, they're scared of the bogeyman that lives yeah, that, in the, uh, that, the that's basement. A, that's utter nonsense. But anyway, <laughs> she does what she's told. I mean, I know that they're lazy, but they're not that lazy. Yeah. They have torches. Yes, exactly. And also, if a room is dark and you can't switch the light on, they'll be interested in what's in that room. <laughs> yeah. So, the prosecutor all issues an international arrest warrant mm -hmm. so that the Belgium police can arrest, arrest Ayutino. Okay. In the meantime, the cops search his house. In the basement where the light bulbs are gone, mm -hmm. they discover a sofa with blood marks and blood on the walls and the floor. They also discover a bloodied woman's watch. God. The cops are pretty sure that's where Ayutino killed someone. Mm -hmm. They don't know who yet. In the courtyard, they also discover a blood-covered metal bar and in the washing machine, a blood-stained jumper. So they know what happened. They yeah. just don't know who was a victim yet. Mm. Very quickly, the Belgium cops find Ayutino at his parents' place at 5.55 on the 27th of February. He really is really lazy. Yes. He is interrogated by the French and Belgian cops in Belgium because the Belgian cops invite the French ones. They're allowed to do that. That was nice of them. He says that on the day he went to the GP for bronchitis, in the surgery room, he spotted Bernadette. He went out, slashed one of her tires, and once she noticed, he helped her change the tire and then offered her to wash her hands at his house, which was nearby, next door. Mm. There, he convinced her to go into the basement and he tried to rape her, but she fought back. So then at that point, he tried to kill her with a metal bar. Eventually, he strangles her with a metal wire. Jesus. Then he dumped her body in a nearby wood at night. So he basically garroted her. Yes. Eventually he confesses to the other two murders as well, and he tells the cops where to find the bodies. So the cops at that point have everything they need to send him for trial. Mm -hmm. On 8th of, April, 8th of April 1992, while in prison, awaiting trial, he retracts his confessions and accuses his father. Of having killed all these women. <laughs> right, okay. The, the cops, man who continually bails you out. Yes. 
But the cops think that it's just a, a way to delay extradition because he needs to be extradited from Belgium ah, to right, France. Because okay, yes. they happened, the actual murders yes. happened in France. And if he can create some doubt that maybe someone else did the crimes, then the, the extradition would take longer and possibly wouldn't happen. The reason why he's worried about being extradited to France is that the justice systems in Belgium and France are different. In France, you have incompressible sentences, i.e. if you're sentenced to 18 years in prison, you do 18 years in prison, uh -huh. not in Belgium. In Belgium, you're, you're eligible for parole very quickly, if not from the start. Really? So he wants to be tried in Belgium because if he's sentenced to 18 years, he might do one. Better deal. Wow. I'm glad he thinks he can do three murders and get out after a year. That guy should not well, be walking he, the street. Technically, he could. Of yes. course, he won't. But technically, he could yes, ask of for, course, of course. for I mean, parole yeah, very I doubt the Pilgrims are that crazy. Yeah, exactly. But in France, he wouldn't be allowed before he's supposed to leave the prison. So no. given three murders, he mm. could be sentenced to... Well, there's been cases of 30 years, but it's very rare. But 20 mm. to 25 is possible for three murders. Yeah. And he would have to do 20 or 25 years. And he doesn't want that. So he tries all he can not to be extradited to France. Mm. Incredibly, while in prison, he manages to take hostages and escape. But having nowhere to go because he's a dumbass... He's Does he not go back to his dad's? Yeah, he's recaptured on the same day. <laughs> dumbass. On the 6th of May 92, he's sentenced for, to two years in prison for his actions in 1988. What action? When he exhibited himself to women. Oh, right, okay. Because he had been caught, but hadn't been for prison for that yet. So now he's going two years for that. Oh, okay, so that, was that like a suspended sentence or something that they gave He hadn't him? been tried, I think, for it yet. Hadn't been tried? That no. was like... Yeah, it, I know. That well, was like it was four he, years earlier. Oh, no, six years before. Four. Four, okay. But even the though, Things take time, and obviously he hadn't been tried for it yet, but now he has, and he's been sentenced to two years in prison. I mean, that's like the, the Indian justice system is kind yeah. of like 90 years behind... <laughs> Yes. And, but that's crazy. Okay, well, at least he's, he's off the streets. Yes. On the 6th of January 93, so six months or so later, mm -hmm. a bit more than six months later, Ayutino is sentenced to three years in prison for his escape from prison and hostage taking. All right, okay, that's good. We're, so we're, we're keeping him where we need him. He appeals. Uh, and he gets five years because the judge decides that the sentence was too late. <laughs> <laughs> so that backfired. In March 93, Marie Antoinette, his wife, is arrested for interfering with the body. Mm. Oh, right, okay. Because she helped him make the body disappear. Oh, what's going on with her life that she thinks that it's okay for her husband to rape oh, and, and kill people? I don't know. On the 19th of August 93, Ayutino is finally extradited to France. Uh -huh. And as it happens, he accuses his brother-in-law of all three murders. Still trying not to get to France. But that doesn't work. Nobody I didn't to actually him. accuse you just before you went to to Scotland. Of yeah, doing yeah, at it, that point, yeah, at that point, the, <laughs> the extradition had been sorted and he's told to fuck off. On the 12th of January 96, the, the cops do a reenactment. Mm -hmm. But Ayutino refuses to take part. The victim family are really angry seeing how he's still delaying things, still dragging his feet, still mm. trying to stop the process. So the prosecutor sends him back to jail waiting trial at that point. They have enough. So the trial starts on the 2nd of March, 98. Oh my God. We're so he's in time prison. is dragging on and dragging yeah. on. He's in prison for f six years yeah. before the final trial. The psychiatrists describe him as a perverse, incurable psychopath, but responsible enough to stand trial. He's, he's just a thoroughly awful scumbag, but at least he's he understands what sound. he's doing. Yeah. yeah, he only admits to Bernadette's murder. Remember, he re he withdrew his confession. Yes, he denies the other two during the trial, mm. even though they're so close. Well, the missing bodies were found following his description. He <laughs> told the to cops okay. when he confessed where the right. bodies were, the cops went and found the bodies. <laughs> now he's saying, oh no, it's not me. It's nothing to do with uh, yeah. me. I, I know where the bodies are. I, I, you know, I, they're, they're very close to me when they went missing, but it's not me. Yeah, exactly. It's someone else. Mm. I just happen to know where they are. Yeah. Oh, this guy's just a nightmare. On the 6th of March 98, after four hours of deliberation, he's sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 18 years. Is that all? 
Well, that's pretty much the biggest sentence you can get here, yeah, unless I there's always some say really that. bad circumstances. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just... You're I'm used s- to the American yes. system with crazy sentences Yeah, like 50 yeah 125 years. years. Yeah, but that doesn't happen here. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Because if it happened here, you would have a case at the human mm. rights court, and that wouldn't stand. You mm. can't sentence someone to... 90 years in prison. That would be I, I'm just, I'm deeply frightened of this guy ever walking the streets, that's all. Yes. The father of one of the victims, when he's sentenced, shouts at him that he'll die in prison. And at that point, Ayutino jumps across the courtroom to attack him. Holy crap. He's stopped by a bunch of gendarmes and yep. they slam him down hard. Oh, I bet they do. <laughs> oh, extra hard. And at that point, even his lawyer is surprised and outraged. Oh, yeah. His lawyer says, What the what? This guy is nuts. Oh, yeah. Um, Marie Antoinette, the wife, is sentenced to six, six months suspended for destroying evidence and interfering with the body at the same time. Okay. And, and th- lady, you need to address what yes. you've got going on in your life that you think it's morally okay yes. for your husband to snuff somebody's life out. Yes. It's not quite the end of the story because he's in prison. He's still in prison. But he's still being an ass. <laughs> in November 98, for example, he's sentenced to five more months in prison, so added to the 18, uh-huh. for destroying four prison cells and assaulting guards. <laughs> this guy is a giant piece of work. Yes. So you'll happy to hear, you'd be happy to hear that he's still in prison. Yes. There's no plan to let him out. Yeah, but hang on a minute. Isn't he roughly about my age? Isn't he a couple, only a couple of years older than me? Uh, yes, he is. Fuck. I'm terrified. I'm terrified, peeps. I'm certainly not going to be moving to the, uh, the northeast of France any time. Uh, sure. He was sentenced in 98, so in 2016... That was the end of his minimal sentence. But he's still in prison. So yeah. he's been doing already seven years more than the minimum. And I suspect he's not going to come out. Oh, I really hope. I just hope he just carries on behaving like a lunatic because he clearly is. Well, anybody examining his uh, parole request would know that he's a total nut job and he's going to kill more. So uh, I, mean, I don't think he's going to let, be let out. You have to take care of kids' brains. If they suffer any trauma when they're a child, it has to be addressed when they're a child. And it's just so sad. It's sad for everybody. It's sad for the victims. It's sad for the victims' families, you know. And I'm not ending with something glib because it's awful. 